Chapter 3 Duty Taking Dr. Willett on board and ignoring cries for help from countless refugees on the dock, the crew of HMS Thunderchild weighed anchor and she glided back out to sea. The captain was furious that his ship was being used as a taxi service for a single civilian, someone with the distinct air of going on a holiday. All along the shoreline, jetties and beaches were crowded with waiting people and littered with cumbersome goods and belongings that many would find impossible to take with them. Rowing boats and dinghies ferried the weary escapees out to larger boats and ships which clogged the estuary with their sheer numbers. The frailty of humanity was never more clear as young men struggled to carry the old through thick mud. Women wept with their mothers. Children too tired to cry watched with wide eyes the unfolding scenes of mass exodus. Despite the new official orders to head directly for Calais at all possible speed, Thunderchild slowed to a halt in the middle of the Blackwater estuary. For three hours or more, the smaller ships and boats, all packed to overcrowding with frightened people, stream slowly past the ironclad, en route to the safety of mainland Europe. Willard's frustration with the situation grew, and he insisted that it was now time to make for France. From Coal House Fort at Tilbury came a low thump of heavy artillery, signalling a fresh engagement with the Martians. Picking up his binoculars, the captain continued to monitor plumes of black smoke from raging fires on the landward horizon in the direction of Tillingham. Suddenly, a group of Martian tripods loomed into view. HMS Thunderchild was the only warship in the immediate vicinity, and the captain knew that the other ironclads of the Channel fleet were too distant to provide assistance to the vulnerable makeshift convoy. From his vantage point, the captain observed how the tripods worked together. An old paddle steamer, low in the water with her decks crowded with refugees, moved painfully slowly, churning water frantically behind her. One of the towering tripods strode into the water, obviously keen to prevent the Duchess or any other rescue ship from escaping. Much to Dr. Willett's surprise, the captain suddenly shouted orders to prepare for action. The ironclad stir, just as two more metal tripods stalked menacingly into the sea from the mudflats. The height and scale of the Martian machines dwarfed the largest of the boats leaving the estuary. With the preservation of human life uppermost in his mind, the captain ordered Thunderchild to attack the nearest tripod. Turning sharply, moving easily through the water, she coursed past the smaller boats which bobbed wildly in her wake, while amber sparks and smoke jetted furiously from her two funnels. Making way through the flotilla at high speed, she accelerated past the Duchess to charge headlong towards the unsuspecting metal monster. With its long, flexible tentacles writhing, the towering menace aimed a canister of black gas in the direction of the ironclad, hitting a hard on the starboard side. Thunderchild, staring away from the poison smoke, was suddenly caught in the searing beam of a heat ray which cut across the ship's bows. The captain finally barked his order to open fire. A deafening blast erupted from the ship's guns and the tripod was immediately pulverized, its wreckage toppling and crashing into the sea. The damaged warship, with her steering gear still intact, now veered sharply to intercept another tripod which instinctively raised its heat ray. Those who watched from the crowded rescue boats now looked on in horror as another invisible beam surged through the dissipating smoke and sliced into the ship's hull. This time it ignited her munitions and the thunder child rose up out of the water in a ball of orange flame. 
an unstoppable forward momentum around the tripod, instantly cutting it down and the impact smashed into smithereens. Then, abruptly and without warning, all turmoil ceased. On the glassy surface of the sea, a shroud of black smoke thinned and drifted away silently from a circle of foam and the place where the ironclad sank. Years later, in 1918, a German warship, deterred by the guns of coastal defence at Curlhaus Fort, hit sunken wreckage as it sailed northwards at low tide. Three sealed jars, one of them newly cracked, bobbed unseen to the surface and were carried by the new tide towards London. Only one man had a possible explanation for the sudden and inexplicable reappearance of the red weed near Canvey Island in 1919.